Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here. Indian Depredations in Texas by J.W. Wilbarger, published all the way back in 1889. Now the story we're going to read about today is episode 3 in my series on the Parker family and the massacre that took place at their fort back in 1836. This episode focuses on some of the captives, mainly Mrs. Kellogg and Mrs. Plummer. Of the captives, we will briefly trace their checkered career. After leaving the fort, the two tribes, the Comanches and Kiowas, remained and traveled together until midnight. They then halted on an open prairie, staked out their horses, placed their pickets, and pitched their camp, bringing all their prisoners together for the first time. They tied their hands behind them with rawhide thongs so tightly as to cut the flesh, tied their feet close together, and threw them upon their faces. Then the braves, gathering around with their yet bloody, dripping scalps, commenced their usual war dance. They danced, screamed, yelled, stamping upon their prisoners, beating them with bows until their own blood came near strangling them. The remainder of the night these frail women suffered, and had to listen to the cries and groans of their tender little children. Mrs. Elizabeth Kellogg soon fell into the hands of the Keechies, from whom, six months after her capture, she was purchased by a party of Delawares, who carried her into Nacogdoches and delivered her to General Houston, who paid them $150, the amount they had paid, and all that they asked. Mrs. Rachel Plummer remained a captive for about 18 months, and to give the reader an idea of her suffering during that period, we will give an extract from her diary. In July and a portion of August, we were among some very high mountains, on which the snow remains for the greater portion of the year, and I suffered more than I had ever done before in my life. It was very seldom I had any covering for my feet, and but very little clothing for my body. I had a certain number of buffalo skins to dress every day, and had to mind the horses at night. This kept me employed pretty much all the time, and often I would take my buffalo skins with me to finish them while I was minding the horses. My feet would often be frostbitten while I was dressing the skins, but I dared not complain for fear of being punished. In October I gave birth to my second son. I say October, but it is all guesswork with me as I had no means of keeping a record of the days as they passed. It was a beautiful and healthy baby, but it was impossible for me to procure suitable comforts for myself and my infant. The Indians were not as harsh in their treatment towards me as I feared they would be, but I was very apprehensive for the safety of my child. I had been with them six months and had learned their language, and I would often beseech my mistress to advise me what to do to save my child, but she turned a deaf ear to all my supplications. My child was six months old when my master, thinking I suppose that it interfered too much with my work, determined to put it out of the way. One cold morning, five or six Indians came where I was suckling my babe. As soon as they came, I felt sick at heart for my fears were aroused for the safety of my child. I felt my whole frame convulsed with sudden dread. My fears were not ill-grounded as one of the Indians took my child and killed it. One of them untied the rope they had used and threw the remains of the child into my lap, and I dug a hole in the earth and buried him. After performing the last sad rites for the lifeless remains of my dear babe, I sat down and gazed with a feeling of relief upon the little grave I had made for it in the wilderness, and could say with David of old, You cannot come to me, but I must go to you. And then, and even now, as I record the dreadful scene I witnessed, I rejoice that my babe had passed from the sorrows and sufferings of this world. I shall hear its dying cries no more, and fully believing in and relying on the imputed righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I feel that my innocent babe is now with kindred spirits in the eternal world of joys. Oh, that my dear Savior may keep me through life's short journey, and bring me to dwell with my children in the realms of eternal bliss. Mrs. Plummer has gone to rest, and no doubt her hopes may have been realized. 
After this, she was given as a servant to a very cruel old squaw who treated her in a most brutal manner. Her son had been carried off by another party to the far west, and she supposed her husband and father had been killed at the massacre. Her infant was dead, and death to her would have been a sweet relief. Her life was hard, and driven almost to desperation, she resolved no longer to submit to the intolerant old squaw. One day, when the two were some distance from, although still in sight of the camp, her mistress attempted to beat her with a club. Determined not to submit to this, she wrenched the club from the hands of the squaw and knocked her down. The Indians who had witnessed the whole proceedings from their camp now came running up, shouting at the top of their voices. She had fully expected to be killed, but they patted her on the shoulder, crying, Bueno, bueno, good, good, or well done. She now fared much better and soon became a great favorite and was known as the Fighting Squaw. She was eventually ransomed through the agency of some Mexican Santa Fe traders by a noble-hearted American merchant of that place, Mr. William Donahue. She was purchased in the Rocky Mountains so far north of Santa Fe that 17 days were consumed in reaching that place. She was at once made a member of her benefactor's family, where she received the kindest of care and attention. Ere long, she accompanied Mr. and Mrs. Donahue on a visit to Independence, Missouri, where she had the pleasure of meeting and embracing her brother-in-law, L.D. Nixon, and by him was escorted back to her people in Texas. During her stay with the Indians, Mrs. Plummer had many thrilling adventures, which she often repeated after her reclamation. In narrating her reminiscences, she said that in one of her rambles after she had been with the Indians some time, she discovered a cave in the mountains, and in company with the old squaw that guarded her, she explored it and found a large diamond, but her mistress immediately demanded it, and she was forced to give it up. She also said here in these mountains she saw a bush which had thorns on it that resembled fish hooks, which the Indians used to catch fish with, and she herself often caught trout with them in the little mountain streams. On the 19th of February, 1838, she reached her father's house exactly 21 months from her capture. She had never seen her little son, James Pratt, since soon after their capture, and knew nothing of his fate. She wrote or dictated a thrilling and graphic history of her capture and the horrors of her captivity, the tortures and hardships she endured, and all the incidents of her life with her captors, with observations among the Indians. The valuable and interesting little book is now rare, scarce, and out of print. In this book, she tells the last she saw of Cynthia Ann and John Parker. Mrs. Plummer died on the 19th of February, 1839, just one year after reaching home. As a remarkable coincidence, it may be stated that she was born on the 19th, married on the 19th, captured on the 19th, released on the 19th, reached Independence, Missouri on the 19th, arrived home in Texas on the 19th, and also died on the 19th of the month. Her son, James Pratt Plummer, after six long and weary years of captivity and suffering, during which time he had lived among many different tribes and traveled several thousand miles, was ransomed and taken to Fort Gibson late in 1842, and reached home in February 1843, in charge of his grandfather. He became a respected citizen of Anderson County, Texas. Both he and his father are now dead. So that's the end of this story. This is episode three in my series on the Parker family. So here we learned about the fates of Mrs. Kellogg, who was ransomed just a few months later, and the longer captivity of Mrs. Plummer that was for 18 months. So on the next episode in this series, we'll find out about the fate of Cynthia Ann Parker. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.